Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Sunday, July 19th in 2020, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of COVID-19. We're so happy that you've uh, joined us to get with us today. Once again, thank you for your support. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, even though we can't be together, it's always a pleasure to uh, be together in this way as best we can. As you can see now, uh, the uh, Medical Officer of Health has asked us to wear masks on uh, inside, and so we are doing that as much as we can. Uh, for preaching, it's going to be a little bit difficult, so I expect I'll take my mask off for that, but generally speaking, uh, that's what we're doing today. Thank you to David and Tim for uh, their technical expertise, as usual, and uh, leading our singing today, we have Jane and Mary, and uh, we're happy to have them back with us today. So now we'll hear the pre prelude, and uh, then we'll begin our worship. Thank you, David. We live in the light of Christ. We live by the light of Christ. We live with the light of Christ surrounding us, holding us, and blessing us. And so now let us worship with the light of Christ. We're going to begin this morning with what I call six gestures of morning praise. Many of you may already have uh, an exercise regimen that you do in the morning. Uh, this is one that uh, I find when I do it and remember to do it, it is a very good grounding exercise. 
And uh, I'll show you the motions and then I'll go through the meditation. It's not very long and it's actually very simple to do. And by the way, if you have mobility issues, uh, you would want to probably stand uh, behind a chair and use the chair for stability. So the first action is simply reaching up toward the heavens like this. The second action is just a gentle movement down to the side like this. The third action is to bring your hand around, hands around to the front. The fourth one is to cup in front of you like this. The fifth action is one that most people vary uh, depending on their abilities. It's actually to touch the earth. Uh, so, but what I often do is I just bend down like this. And then the sixth action is to swing your arms back up like this and form a cross across your body like this and bow. So let's try that and uh, I'll read you the meditation and then during the week you can practice this on your own. So as I reach up above me, I feel my soul rising with the dawn. And then as I reach out beside me, I notice all that is within my field of vision and I practice compassion for everything that I see. As I reach in front of me and extend my arms in front of me, I offer all that I have and all that I can give to the life of the world and the life of those around me. And then as I cup my hands in front of me, I hope that I'm able to accept everything that is coming toward me today. As I reach toward the earth and touch the earth, I'm filled with gratitude for all of the gifts that I have received so far today. And then as I bring my arms up and cross them in front of me and bow gently, may I be a light to the world and may your light shine through me, O oh God. So I hope that you'll give that practice a try during the week. We're going to now sing our first hymn, which is 232 in Voices United, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You.
So for our prayer, um, I'm wanting to draw your attention to this rock and remembering in the story of uh, Jacob in Genesis how uh, he slept on a stone pillow. And while he was sleeping on a stone pillow, he had the dream in which he, he saw God for the first time. And so in our prayer, uh, I reference that, and then uh, there's a quiet moment, and then we end with the Lord's Prayer, as we usually do. Let us pray. O oh God, did St. Columba really sleep on a stone pillow all those years in his monk's cell as Jacob had? We would never choose such discomfort some of us search a lifetime for just the right pillow. Most of us prefer not to think of things which make us uncomfortable. We do not like awkward silence. We shrink away from things which remind us of our foibles or mistakes. Other times we hold back when we know we should move first. We lose trust in others, in ourselves, and in your love, O oh God. We hope a problem will go away if we ignore it long enough. In all these times, we have not been gentle with ourselves. Yet you, O oh Spirit of love and blessing, you are present. You are always present even in the worst times of our lives. You walk beside us even when we feel like we have failed. You speak to us in nature or in the depth of our hearts. Your calm energy has never abandoned us. And even in COVID time, this restless time, this time of many stone pillows, you are there in our lives. Your love surrounds us and comforts us. Your peace leads us. You fill us with quiet strength. In these moments, let us remember those who are going through tough times, those who are grieving, those who are lonesome, those who are isolated, those who are at wit's end. Let us remember our children now long away from school and routine. Let us remember frazzled parents. Let us remember those who have lost their jobs. Let us, in our hearts, be full of gentle energy and find the way to assure them that they are loved. Now let's take a quiet moment of prayer. bringing our voices and hearts back together, let us pray the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Time to sing again another hymn. This time it is 157 in more voices. I am a child of God.
Well, as we come to our scripture readings for today, uh, there are two from uh, the middle of the book of Genesis, chapters 28 through 32. Obviously, we can't read the whole story because it's quite complex and quite long, and it's just one of those sagas that really needs to be uh, unpacked and a lot of time spent with. but there is lots to, lots of to catch up uh, through the story since uh, last time. Uh, Abraham has died. His son Isaac was able to find a wife named Rebecca. They had two sons. They were twins. Uh, Esau, the hairy one, was born first. And uh, Jacob, the uh, schemer, the deceiving one, he was born second. It was said that when uh, Jacob was born, he had the uh, heel of Esau in his hand uh, as he came out of the womb. Um, Much of the story is about how Isaac preferred Esau and how Rebekah preferred Jacob. Obviously, Rebekah wanted Jacob to inherit all of Isaac's wealth, prestige, power, but mostly Abraham's blessing. And you know, there's probably you probably know the story where uh, they tricked Isaac into uh, taking it away from Esau and giving it to Jacob. Uh, when that happened, uh, Esau vowed that uh, he would go to the ends of the earth to kill Jacob uh, once Isaac and Rebekah were dead. And so Uh, Jacob runs off for fear of his life. He goes to live with Rachel's brother Laban, and uh, this is what happens on the way. Jacob left Beersheba and went to Haran. He came to a certain place and camped for the night, since the sun had set. He took one of the stones there, set it under his head, and lay down to sleep, and he dreamed. A stairway was set on the ground, and it reached all the way to the sky. Angels of God were going up and going down on it. Then God was right before him, saying, I am God, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. I'm giving the ground on which you are sleeping to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will be as the dust of the earth. They'll stretch from west to east and from north to south. All the families of the earth will bless themselves in you and your descendants. I'll stay with you. I'll protect you wherever you go. And I'll bring you back to this very ground. I'll stick with you until I've done everything I promised you. Jacob woke up from his sleep He said, God is in this place truly, and I didn't know it. He was terrified. He whispered in awe, incredible, wonderful, holy. This is God's house. This is the gate of heaven. So first thing in the morning, he took the stone that he had used for his pillow and stood it up as a memorial pillow, a memorial pillar, and poured oil over it. He christened the place Bethel, which means house of God. The name of the town had been Luz before then. Jacob vowed a vow, if God stands by me and protects me on this journey on which I'm setting out and keeps me in food and clothing and brings me back in one piece to my father's house, then this God will be my God. This stone I have set up as a memorial pillar will mark this as a place where God lives, and everything you give me, I'll return a tenth to you. It took 21 years, and having had 12, at least 12 children with four different women, two of them his wives, Leah and Rachel, it was time to go back to Canaan and to take claim of his inheritance, the one he had stolen from Esau. He knew he would have to face Esau once and for all. He was part bravado and part fear. Along the way, he went off by himself one night so that he could be alone with his thoughts. This is what happened. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok River. He got them safely across the brook, along with all his possessions. But he stayed behind by himself, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he couldn't get the best of Jacob as they wrestled, 
He deliberately threw Jacob's hip out of joint. The man said, Let me go now, it's daybreak. Jacob said, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. The man said, What's your name? He answered, Jacob. The man said, No longer. Your name is no longer Jacob. From now on, it's Israel, which means struggle with God. You've wrestled with God, and you have come through. Jacob asked him, What's your name? The man said, Why do you want to know my name? And then, right then and there, he blessed him. Jacob named this place Peniel, which means the face of God, because he said, I saw God face to face and lived to tell the story. The sun came up as he left Peniel, limping because of his hip. This is why Israelites to this day don't eat the hip muscle because Jacob's hip was thrown out of joint. I'd like to begin with a little story. It's about an older man with whom I'd had many disagreements at church who called me up one day and said he'd like to settle his accounts. I knew right away he wasn't talking financial. He was talking about settling the score with me. You see, we had been adversaries, mostly in a passive-aggressive sense, something I'm not too proud to admit out loud. He talked to his people and moaned and complained about me and all the things that he thought were wrong with me. I talked to my people and I said, you know, feigned uh, misunderstanding and defended my ego and my honor. It It had gone on long enough that it was time to sort out the impasse and be able to move on. And Robert, that was his name, made the first move. So he came to my office. He looked me straight in the face. He sat down with intent and said nothing. But I can tell you a lot was said in that silence. And in that pregnant moment, I wasn't sure what was going to happen next. I honestly didn't know whether he might just reach over and punch me in the face or something. But I was conscious of one thing going on in my being. As he sat there, I closed my heart. I closed my heart so that whatever might transpire, it wouldn't penetrate, nor would it unnerve me in my resolve. It was a really dumb thing to do. Worse, because I was conscious of it as I did it. Even now, after all of these years, it's one of those things I'm still kind of ashamed of as I think about it. Robert had come to lay down his weapons He asked me to release him of the burden of carrying them, as if I had the power to do such a thing. He asked me to forgive him. And would I do him the honor, then, of presiding at his funeral when and if that should come? In fact, it did come just a few months later. For a very proud older man, it took a lot of guts for him to do that after all that we'd been through. I thought about the many different burdens he must have been carrying throughout his whole life. And isn't it true that those few things that we do carry with us through our whole lives, those things that we feel are owed to us, or those stories that we just won't allow to be amended with new truth, um, those slights or hurts or unresolved feelings that we have nurtured or buried in our hearts, they carry a lot of energy. And we use a lot of energy to to keep them uh, submerged and protecting ourselves from them. And as you all know, sometimes you have to admit defeat and admit you are wrong and admit, in fact, that it was you who was uh, carrying on the grudge match and you who was wasting the energy of the many years you participated in it. Now, I'm sure none of you have ever done anything quite so egregious, but that day, as Robert brought his open-hearted apology to me, 
I knew right away that something was going to be demanded of me, whether I wanted to or not. And what I noticed was that as my heart began to open, I noticed that I was able to see him in an entirely new way. His face softened. His his face seemed rounder or, or something, and his whole body kind of relaxed. His countenance, to use a biblical word, seemed different. And so I'm so glad that you're not all sitting here in front of me uh, as I tell this, because what happened was I cried. I broke down in front of him and and cried. To I think it was partly just the release of all of the tension, but as I think about it, it was mostly seeing the beauty of a man change in a moment. How can a person change in a moment? That day was one of the highlights of my life. Later, we would joke with each other about how we had found a worthy adversary in each other, someone to wrestle with. It's just that usually the wrestling matches of our lives often have very real impacts, especially when we work so hard not to resolve them. We get hurt, we nurse our anger, we refuse to learn anything about ourselves in the bargain, and then when the next person who kind of resembles Robert comes along, we project all of the same things onto that next person, having learned nothing in the first place. It makes it really difficult for us to move forward. It makes it almost impossible for us to change. What if we could just stop? I mean, what if we could just stop wrestling? What if we could just stop wrestling with each other or, you know, in the church context, wrestling with God, even? There's a proverb in uh, the Old Testament that says, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth have been set on edge. So what if we just stopped eating the grapes? What if we just stopped eating the grapes? So as I was reading through the stories of Jacob and Esau these uh, last couple of weeks, I realized that many of us are really wrestling with COVID. It's not over yet. And so we're having to wrestle with this idea of This is going to go on for for quite a while. Because much of of what we are discussing, and and here at the church too, uh, planning for and arranging our lives around is based on the premise that there will come a day when there will be a vaccine for the virus and we won't have to wear these pesky masks. We'll be able to shake hands and, and hug one another once again. But what if that day is quite a long time in the future. Much of our energy is focused on this future time, a future that we must admit is certainly not certain. I feel like I'm waffling between two poles of energy, the pole of the, the hope that this is going to end and there'll be a vaccine and we can get life back to normal, and the, on the other side, the despair of a prolonged period of uncertainty. And for me, I think it's the uncertainty that makes me so anxious. A friend on Facebook posted a a meme calling it a Corona coaster, the Corona coaster. And that kind of summed it up for me. Well, Jacob had wronged his brother Esau in many ways. Let's just think about Jacob for a moment. Jacob was a liar and a cheat. He was a manipulator and a schemer. I mean, there are many, many stories about him in the Old Testament. He went on to be the patriarch of Israel, right? In fact, he was given the name Israel. And the stories about him are anything but lovely. 
He tricked Esau out of his birthright and stole from him the father's blessing. Basically, Jacob was a wretch. He was consumed by his own self-importance. And when he was around, let's face it, there was no energy left for anybody in the room. That kind of ego need. And then when he ran away from Canaan on the advice of his mother, running for fear of his life, he stopped for the night, his fitful sleep on a stone for a pillow, a vision of angels going up and down a staircase. He said he saw God. I wonder if in that moment he changed. Can we change that quickly? Then he kept going. His life on the run was anything but blessed. He found someone he loved, a woman named Rachel, who was Laban's daughter. Uh, Laban made him marry his first daughter, Leah, first, and made uh, Jacob work for actually 21 years on his farm before he reluctantly then allowed him to marry Rachel. And by the time we get to the end of all of these stories, we have very little sympathy for Jacob. He's a lout. He's a deceiver. He deserves what he gets. Now, in Luke's gospel, we're told the story of a prodigal son. Here, the young brother is also a lout and a deceiver. He runs off to spend his inheritance on wine, women, and song, and then returns to his father, penniless and foolish, thinking that maybe his father will give him a job cleaning out pigsties or something like that. You can imagine him thinking this through, running through all the possibilities, fearing his older brother's wrath, yet somehow taking a wager on the goodness of the father, wrestling it through so to speak. Turns out the older brother was really angry, and we never really do hear how the story ends. And that's because in this story, the character of God or the character of the Father is what drives the, the meaning of the parable. And so it's important for us to sometimes step back a little bit and realize that most of our ideas about God in particular are Old Testament ideas. Because still, 2,000 years later, that's how long it's been, we still haven't understood the God that Jesus talks about. It's a different picture. It's a different version of God. So, you could ask any group, as I have done, any group of kids in a confirmation class to describe to you what God looks like, and they will say an old man in the sky, kind of Zeus-like, throwing uh, um, lightning bolts on people who sin or uh, are, are corrupt. And it's as if somehow, as a culture and as a world, we're just not able to move beyond those old notions because here, Jesus gives us a more complete picture of God. And I'm going to name some of those characteristics that come out of this one parable, this prodigal son parable. Passionate, compassionate, generous, forgiving, merciful, even when mercy is not deserved, patient, giving, embracing, open-hearted, over-the-top emotional, foolish, foolish for love, outrageously unconditional, never giving up, never stops waiting for you to see the light, never stops waiting for you to see the truth, doesn't care about your past, however sinful, doesn't try to shame you even if you feel ashamed of yourself, doesn't rub your nose in your mistakes, doesn't care how messed up you are, doesn't care if you've made a royal mess of your life, and, after all is said and done, still wants to bless you and bring you back into the fold, kill the fatted calf, have a party, and, who doesn't care who is watching, goes out to greet you, running in his robes, kisses you on the neck, and, well, you get the picture. This is a very outrageous 
God that Jesus portrays. This is the face of God that I saw in Robert's change that day. In our day, it's kind of simplistic and unscientific and non-nuanced and, let's face it, just non-trendy to talk about God in this way, especially for those of us who consider ourselves to be progressive and who aren't interested at all in a personal God of any kind. But in fact, Jesus goes beyond the the personal God and, and paints a picture of a God who is right with us inside our marrow, inside our minds, inside our, our feelings, inside our mistakes, inside our inabilities, inside our defensiveness, inside our unwillingness to change. We might call the God that Jesus describes as the unconditional love forever which is probably why 2,000 years later we still haven't understood what he's talking about because it's anything but human, isn't it? Is there anything unconditional about our love? Anyway, when Esau sees Jacob coming, Esau, having brought with him an army of 400 men just in case they do have to fight, Jacob, limping and weak after a night of wrestling with God or his shadow or his fears or whatever that was, what does Esau do? This is one of the highlight stories of the Old Testament. What does Esau do? He runs to Jacob. He hugs him. He kisses him on the neck. And he welcomes him back into the fold as his equal. It was absolutely the least expected outcome because who could love a wretch like Jacob? And what did Jacob then say to Esau? He said, I saw the face of God in you. He saw the face of God in Esau? Do you see how unbelievable that is? This is the one who stole everything from him, able to see the face of God in him? But remember, the night before, he had wrestled with that dark angel, whatever it was, and he's saw the face of God, he said there, in one night. Jacob changed. In one night, he was transformed from a wretch, a cheat, a liar, a manipulative brat, into an open-hearted child of God. In one night, he could finally stop wrestling. I've never seen transformation happen so fast because, let's face it, for me it takes years. But here's the thing. When we get to the end of this whole saga, this whole story about these two brothers finally coming together and we're just getting ready to move on to the next part of the story, The very last phrase. Vayavo Yaakov Shalem. What does Vayavo Yaakov Shalem mean? It means Jacob emerged complete. After 22 years of wrestling, Jacob emerged complete. Have you ever thought that you have arrived at this point in your life, right now, today, after everything that has transpired in your life, all your own personal struggles, your mistakes, 
your successes, your failings, your achievements, your misgivings, your blind spots, your lack of insight, your profound abilities, all of those things that you have emerged complete. And as we enter the long haul of COVID and ride that Corona coaster through whatever is in store for us, what if we carry that message? We'll emerge complete. I know most people don't think the Bible matters anymore, that it isn't relative to us at all. It seems like all the old meta-narratives, the grand narratives, have gone into the dumpster. But every once in a while, isn't it nice to be able to step out of your own self-imposed box of limited expectations or uh, your own self-crafted narrative, however small, for yourself, focused mostly on yourself and your own needs, and to step outside into the sunrise onto solid ground. And that's how I've come to see some of these Old Testament stories. Not all of them, for sure. I don't like some of them. But Jacob and Esau, if it were a Netflix series, you'd be riveted to the TV. In the end, isn't it what we all wish for is a sense of completeness and to emerge from our lives complete? What does Jesus offer us? He says, in God, you are complete. Simple as that. Amen. Our last hymn is in the Voices United hymn book. It's number 586, We Shall Go Out.
Gosh, I love that hymn. Thank you for joining us for worship today, and uh, we'll see you next week. And uh, as we go, let us go in the light of Christ. Let us go with the light of Christ in front of us, the light of Christ behind us, the light of Christ beside us, beneath us, above us, and all around us. And may we go knowing that in the light of Christ, we are complete. Amen.